I see it is you've got two choices. You can either keep pretending like nothing bad's ever gonna happen to you, and then when it does, you're saying, uh-oh, or you can get ahead of what's coming so that when it does, not if, you're ready for it, and you're sitting pretty, sipping on Mai Tais next to the pool, working on that Caribbean suntan, because you got it covered. So folks, it's time for you to learn the truth about money. It's time for you to take back control of your money so that you are ready for what's about to happen. By doing that, you're setting yourself up for absolute success. No matter what comes your way, you're ready for it. And that's what I want for you, and I wanna help you with that. So go to chrisnoggle.com and sign up for the Wealth Webinar. We do them every Wednesday at 1 p.m., and you need to be there because it's time. For over 90 years, we've been crash testing our cars in the tireless pursuit of automotive safety. At Volvo, safety's been first since 1927. We've saved millions of lives with the invention of the three-point seatbelt in 1959. At Volvo, we've made driving safer for you and them. Visit safety.finleyvolvo.com to learn more. So they say if you give a man a gun, he'll rob a bank. But if you give a man a bank, he'll rob everybody. The good news for you is Private Money Club runs solely on peer-to-peer -peer relationships, which means no banks allowed. So finally, there's a community for real estate entrepreneurs where it is truly a win-win solution. This community is a place where you can connect with other lenders and other borrowers, and the end results, massive growth for you. You get to build your real estate empire, and you get to do it solving other people's problems. So if that sounds like a place you want to be, well, then join us. Go to privatemoneyclub.com forward slash Kelly. And if you want 500 bucks off, just add the code Kelly500 and I'll knock 500 bucks off the premier membership. We'll see you on the inside. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas podcast where attitude is everything. I have the greatest job in the entire world. The reason why, because I get to make a ton of friends. Um, I get to make silly, silly mistakes, which you'll hear about in the, <laughs> throughout this episode today. And I get to make the coolest friends in the world who do the craziest things and that are superheroes. And then I don't have to be any of them. All I get to do is just be myself. So it, it's amazing the way that I met this young man. We'll get into it later, but this is an Olympic bronze medalist, world record holding speed skater, and one of the most elite athletes in the world, but that's not the reason why I love him so much. Why I love him is because his humility, and he was willing to stop on the side of the road and save my life. So my wife thanks him, I thank him, and he's going to teach me today how to actually prepare for some of this dumb stuff that I get myself into. Uh, but this man is unbelievable, not only uh, in, in his sport being elite, but also his friendship with his brother, his friendship with the, uh, you know, his, his relationships and his family, and also the, the acumen that he has. He, he got his uh, bachelor's at Marquette um, and also uh, working on his, uh, his uh, master's degree at John Hopkins. And uh, with a, uh, he's working on a structural engineering degree in addition to being an Olympian. So it's my honor, my pleasure to introduce Mr. Emery Lehman to the show. Hey, Kelly. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Hey, it's so incredible, man. So let's, let's start off right off the bat, like um, the training aspect. This is for my wife, Brooklyn. So Brooklyn, if you're listening, which you probably aren't, because I don't know that you listen to that many of the podcasts. Um, but... <clears throat> um, she asked me today, she's like, can you ask Emery about a training regimen that would actually get you ready to do something? Talk to us about how an Olympian actually trains. Yeah, so we, we're in such a weird sport. You know, speed skating is so weird. It's very niche. A lot of people probably haven't even heard of it. You know, like back in the day, there was, you know, the Eric Hyden and Dan Jansen and Bonnie Blairs. But um, as of recently, you know, we only had – I think Apollo Ono got more famous from dancing with the stars than he did from speed skating. But uh, so it's a weird sport where we, we ended up spending more time doing other types of training than we actually do spend on the ice. I would say, you know, we bike, we lift weights, we do dry land, we, uh, we rollerblade around. And then on top of all that, we, we speed skate. So there's like a lot of things that we do to it. There's a lot of balances, a lot of sacrifices and, 
you know, we just try and stay well-rounded so that we could skate our fastest all year. So take us to the seven-year-old uh, uh, Emery, because we were talking about it, and I said, I believe that God didn't bless me uh, as an Olympian because I would wear a Speedo and wear my medal and go to the mall and just want people to see it. You said at seven years old you had that same thought. Did you think at seven years old, did you know at seven years old that you were going to be an Olympian? You know, I think at seven years old when I would started, I had like no – concept of how hard it would be or anything you know you're seven years old you're like i want to be a pro lacrosse player hockey player and speed skate i want to do all three i'm going to do them all at once and as you grow older you realize how hard it is to be good at one of those things um so i kind of chose the path of speed skating it was tough and i think as i got really good my hopes got really high and then as you start trying inching closer and closer to the top you're hopes kind of dissipate sometimes, but I think in the end, like if you'd asked me and at the 2018 Olympics, like in four years, you guys will have an Olympic medal. I'd be like, you're crazy. But, uh, if you had asked me that when I was seven, I would have been like, hell yeah, of course I am. <laughs> so what, I mean, I think we're all inspired by you and, and thank you too, for representing our company or our country. Um, we're all inspired by that, but I think we're more inspired that you're an actual person. Can you take us through some of the lumps that you took on the way to the bronze? Because I think that's where most people really connect uh, with you is the fact that you're a real person. You go through real things. Yeah. I, you know, I, I definitely struggle a lot, like balancing, you know, a lot of people in speed skating, um, once they get out of high school or whatever, primary school, whatever it is across the world, they go straight from that into training full time onto a professional team or national team. And, you know, that's what they do. Whereas, you know, here it's tough because, you know, we're not really fully funded by the government, stuff like that. So I was like, I don't want to be done with skating and not be ready to get a job, move on with my life. So I decided to balance the two. And that was like a lot, you know, when it, it took, it took a couple of years to realize that going to school full time and trying to train full time is going to make me really tired <laughs> and both are going to suffer. So that, that was like a really tough trying to get through school and trying to stay on top of the training and also trying to maintain a balance of a social life, you know, all those things, it, it wore, it wears you down. And I got really sick in between my first Olympic team and second, uh, between 2014, and 2018, got really sick with mono. And so for like two years there, I was like going to the rink, skating really fast, show up the next day, like couldn't even do a lap and just skating horrible. So that was as tough as that was physically, that was mentally a lot, a lot more draining than anything. And that, I think that is one of the toughest parts about speed skating, but also all sports is like, you know, a lot of people can do the physical aspects, but just the mental part is, is the hardest thing to overcome. Well, <clears throat> I was unaware of this until recently. I just watched a documentary, and so I feel like I'm an expert um, on it now. Because once I watched the the documentary, I'm like, you know, I'm the man. Um, yeah. But I, I watched it. It was interesting because I watched this documentary on uh, Olympic athletes. And from an outside perspective, like a normal person like myself, um, we think, okay, well, you're an Olympian, so that's your profession. Um there's tons of money flowing in. Um, there's sponsorships flowing in. Life is, you know, here, like at the, all levels. And, you know, then you got to go train and then you got to go get the medal. And, and we watch you on TV and we're like, oh, my gosh. But then I saw the reality part of it that a lot of the people weren't getting compensated during the time. They were having to, like you said, have a job during the time. Can you take us behind the scenes on those kind of things? Because I think that's a part that most of us don't understand. Yeah. So a lot of other countries, like if I was going to say like Italy or Germany, for instance, they have programs where if you want to be a police officer or a, uh, in the army, you can also kind of get your salary subsidized to skate. As long as you're doing certain results, like you're making a living wage. That's not a thing in the U S you know, all of our funding is, uh, pretty much determined on how you do the previous year. So it's not even locked in for four years. Like, so after the Olympic, there's three tiers of funding. Uh, if there's top level funding, which is for people that are finishing on the podium, 
there's uh, tier two funding, which is people that are finishing top eight. And then there's tier three, which is top 16. And then outside of that, you don't get paid. And so it's pretty cutthroat. And so for instance, last year, my teammates, Ethan Casey and I, you know, we were, had the fastest time of the year at any World Cups. We medaled in all three World Cups at, in every team pursuit, two gold, one silver. We were the overall World Cup chance in the team pursuit. And I happened to fall in the last corner. We were on our way most likely to a bronze medal at World Championships, but I fell. And even with all those accolades, the USOPC determined that it was – you know, we weren't, we weren't worthy of the tier one, the metal contender funding. So like, just like that one quick fall in a race like that. And you know, that's, that's money out the door for us, unfortunately. So it's, it's very cutthroat and it's, it takes a lot out of you having to like, not only worry about performing, but then that also kind of goes into how much money you're making. So Emery, uh, with social media today, I think we get exposed to so much that we didn't get exposed to before. So people have desires that a lot of times, like my dad would say, don't ever write a check um, like that your butt can't cash. Or he would say, don't let your parakeet or your alligator mouth overload your parakeet butt, right? <laughs> he, he would say these things all the time. I'd be like, ah, okay, whatever. But in today's society with social media, uh, again, a lot of times we become aware of something, aware of a lot more than we could ever imagine. And we become aware of an Olympic medal and we're like, oh yeah, my, you know, the world tells me I could do anything. So I'm just going to go do that thing. Can you take us back into like high school? Because you go from high school into college. I mean, take us through that part and the things that you have to go through to actually do the things that, you know, most of us normal people, maybe we desire it, but we ain't got the, the, uh, the physical ability or the mental fortitude to be able to make it through and actually accomplish it? Yeah. You know, that probably, that's a great question. It's probably a better question asked to my mother because she probably made way more set. My mom and dad made way more sacrifices than I had to in high school to get to that first point and continue past that. Um, but, you know, I, I, went to school year round. Like I would usually take four classes in the fall and spring. So kind of like half of what all my classmates would take, but then I would also take like three or four classes over the summer to like make up for that. And, uh, on with all that free time, everyone was so jealous of all the free time I had. Cause I was getting out of school at, you know, noon. Um, but like my mom would pick me up, I'd eat, I'd take a nap in the car. We'd go up to the Pettit Center in Milwaukee, which is an hour and 45 minutes from Oak Park. Uh, I'd skate, then my mom would drive me back down and then I'd have, you know, another practice or I'd have hockey practice. So it was just a lot. It was, it was a big time commitment. I, I had to do the easy part. I just had to show up, work out, listen to my coach. Um, but my mom and dad had the tough part of coordinating everything and doing the driving, putting up with me when I'm cranky, stuff like that. What, what about the jump from high school to college? Because this is not something that a lot uh, we hear a lot about. You, you hear a, um, an elite athlete in high school, they assume right off the bat, oh, I'm just going to the co uh, college and it's just going to be the same. But then you get to college and it's all the elite people and there's none of the other stuff. And then you go to the pro level and it's only the elite, elite from college and there's none of the other people. Can you talk yeah. about that progression and how tough it gets at every stage? Yeah. Well, so because speed skating is set up the way it's set up, so it's not a collegiate sport at all. So like this for people who want to continue from speed skating from high school on into college and so on, you really have to have this full commitment of like, I'm willing to do all this I mean, you have a support team, but you know, without the support of the university. So for me, it was like, I was going to Marquette. I was moving away from home. My mom wasn't cooking for me, driving for me, coordinating anything. She was like, you know how to do that by now. You've seen me do it. You know how to do it. If you need help, I'm there to help, but you know, I'm not in Milwaukee. You gotta, you gotta start living your life. So that was really tough going from like in a high school, you know, your parents are like, you got to do this because this is what's best for you. And in college, you're like, 
man, I got to know what's best for me. And like, I got, even if I don't want to do it, like my parent is my mom or dad isn't around to be like, you have to go to practice tonight because you know, you signed up, this is a commitment. You got to see this commitment through in college. It was like, you got to go because like, do you want to get better or do you want to just like waste your time and just half-ass everything, you know? So that, that, that was the biggest thing was like finding that self-motivation. I found that, you know, I did well in school and high school, but I did, a lot better in college just because I was kind of motivating myself like why am I here and same with skating like although I went through all those tough times and got sick and all that it was like I know there's a light at the end of the tunnel I know I just need to put in the work keep my head down stay strong and uh it it did work out but you know at, at the time you know there's a lot of uncertainty you don't really know what's going to happen I mean I want to talk about the killer instinct Right. Because to do things at the level that you that you're doing it, you have to have a killer instinct, but also to be a human being, you got to know when to turn it on and when to turn it off. Who taught you that? How'd you learn it? And how can someone out there that's listening learn that? Yeah, I think I mean, you, you learn by your role models, right? You know, my mom, my dad, my brother, like those are people that, you know, I look up to, you know, I saw my mom is just she is she's on top of everything she's ferocious she is determined and i think i get a lot of that from her um my brother super competitive super smart like always kind of pushing me like i would bug him when he was younger like he's like i'm gonna go work out and i was like i'm gonna do everything you're doing and he was just like trying to get rid of me and work out so hard that i would just quit but i was just trying to keep up with him trying to beat him whatever and then I think I get a lot of like my work ethic, stuff like that from my dad, you know, he works for himself and he would do all, he's, he's up before any of us working out. He's working all day, drives us to practices, you know, gets dinner ready for us. And then, you know, as we are getting ready to go to bed, he's still working. He's up in his office working. So I think a combination of growing up in the, the Lehman household really shaped me into who I am just cause like I had those three amazing people on top of all my close friends and other, other family, but really just my mom, my dad, my brother really, you know, shaped me, I think, into the, the work ethic and instinct and all that rat balled into one that I have today. <laughs> well, let's talk about, let's talk about big brother. You and I have that in common. I got a big brother that when I describe my big brother, Rob, you know, you're watching and um, my Rob is good at everything everything. Now, when I said this to him as an adult, he was like, no, I just work harder than people. And I didn't realize that. I thought as a kid, I was like, he would get, he would play basketball. Now he would do this to me. He would tell me he was going to beat me and how he was going to beat me. Then he would go and beat me exactly the way that he told me he was going to beat me. And then afterwards he would laugh and be like, I beat you like this. Right. And that created like this. I, 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 and I still can't, I mean, anything we compete at, he beats me every time, but can you talk about that relationship with your brother and maybe give us some specific times where you saw that killer instinct in your brother that you said, Oh, wow. Okay. I'm going to start to apply that in my life. Yeah. It's funny when I had made my first Olympic team, they wrote the Oak Park journal wrote an article about, we had a basketball hoop in our backyard. And they wrote an article about my brother and I playing basketball. And it was funny because, like, we're not basketball players. And so all the people in high school were like, why are they writing an article about the Lehman Brothers playing basketball? And I think it just more spoke to our competitiveness where it was like, you know, I was bigger than him, but he was very physical. And we do something, do a play, get in a massive fight, then pick the ball up and be like, okay, one nothing, let's go. You know, and just, like, do that over and over. And I think, like – that was more the point of the story than the actual the sport we were playing i think it could have been like that like you know i would i would tell him every day like yeah i can beat you in tennis and then he'd just go kick my ass in tennis and we go to the courts and, and then like he was like yeah i can beat you in like roller hockey and i'd go there and kick his ass in that and so like we just had a lot of that nature in us and i think that really like yeah it, it just helped us into like you can get your ass kicked but as long as you you know keep doing it keep keep uh working for it and just staying competitive. What's another defining moment? One of the reason why I say it in an example of it is one of the defining moments for me with my brother. Now I was always best friends. He's my hero. I look up to him. I mean, this is, he's my guy. And I remember one time we were in um, Florida and 
I was talking mad crap because I was, you know, the baby in the family. I knew I had bigger brothers and I was fine. But I was talking mad crap to this kid and this kid like said something back to me. And it was my brother's best friend. Well, my brother whooped his tail. And then, I, and I was like, yeah, what now? You know, I was, I, I had that, that, that false confidence. Then my brother turned around and whooped me because he had to whoop his best friend because I was acting up. <laughs> and I real and I realized like, that's my guy. Like, he, I mean, he did the right thing, but then he taught me the lesson afterwards. Yeah. What, what was one of the, I mean, I know there's a ton of them because you and your bu- brother are best friends talking almost every day. Take us into that Lehman Brothers time where, you know, maybe a defining moment for you with them. Yeah, I, um, I'm trying to think. One, one example I have is I remember one time I was running my mouth telling him like, I, I can beat you in tennis. And my brother was a pitcher in baseball. And so he could always serve incredibly fast. Like when he was a kid, he could do these fast serve competitions. And so I remember distinctly going to the courts and he was like, you ready? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, I'll just like give you an easy serve. And I was like, no, like give, like play, play me like you were playing an opponent. And he served one and it came and like, I'm a pretty coordinated guy, but like he served it so fast, it hit me in the chest. And I was like, and then of course that broke into a fight and he's like, what? Like, that's, that's how we do it. Like you got to hit it right at the guy. So they have to move out of the way and hit it. I was like, okay, maybe I need a little help. Like serve me one to my forehand. And I remember him serving one of my forehand and trying to hit it. And it broke all the, like two or three strings on the racket. And I was like, okay, like maybe you're pretty good at this. And maybe there's a reason, like you're a tennis player. And I just, I remember that so distinctly, like I got to go home because I don't have a racket now. (laughs) (laughs) So Emery, take us, uh, when we were talking about the, the, that killer instinct, right. And that, that apex predator, I love this mentality and I love to see it and I love to see it turn on, right. Take us to your first Olympics because you got to get in that zone. How do you get in the zone, but set the stage for us because most of us <laughs> that are listening or watching, we're never going to experience it. We are going to watch yeah. it on TV, but we ain't going to have the uniform on walk out. I mean, maybe now that we're best friends, you know, you could bring a plus one next time. You know what I'm saying? I'm yeah. there for you. I'm with you, man. I'll carry the medal. I'm there. <laughs> But take us to that place and and tell us about the switch and how do you get there? Yeah, I I think the best story for that is, so the way the Olympic trials works for speed skating is if you win a distance and that distance has an Olympic spot like available, like you you get that spot at the Olympics hands down. But with the way the sport of speed skating is and they're kind of, uh, it's getting harder and harder to make the team. If you get, even if they say like, we have three spots in the men's thousand meter and you get third, if so many people make the team, like they can only take eight people, I think for the next Olympics is the max. So if there's 15 spots up for grabs and 15 different people get every one of those spots, which is very unlikely, but could happen, you then they, they're going to have to cut seven people, even though they qualified for the Olympics. So my first Olympic team, I got second place in the 5k we had three 5k spots so they said you know like obviously like if there's less at that time we had maximum of 10 people so they said if less than 10 people make the team like that 5k spot is yours so going into the last day i was like man like i i'm on the team but i'm not officially on the team like if someone else sneaks in then i could kind of get bumped off a little nervous about that so Last day was the 10K, and I was paired with my teammate who had won the 5K, Jonathan Cook, phenomenal skater. I mean, Olympic silver medalist, world championship medalist, phenomenal skater. Uh, He was also my teammate that year. And he usually beats me by like 20 or 30 seconds in a 10K. And so going into that race, I was like, you know, like, I don't know if I really, I don't know if I really want to do this. And I just remember my mom, of course, my mom being my mom, like, you got this, you're going to win, you can do this, anything can happen, it's a sport, like, crazier things have happened. 
So I remember going into that race, I was the second to last pair. I was paired with Jonathan and, you know, even going into that race, I was like, I'm just going to keep my head down, finish this race. And hopefully no one, nothing crazy happens. And I'm on the Olympic team. And so even like for the first 10 laps, I was, we said it was a 400 meter oval. I was a half lap down. So like Jonathan was so far ahead of me, like I couldn't even see him. And the way the rink works in Salt Lake City is there's a lap board in the corner. So you can skip once you pass the finish line and enter the corner, you can kind of see out of the corner of your eye what your lap time was and what the other guy's lap time was. And so with about they actually like cut to a commercial break because it was a 10K. So they cut to a commercial break in the middle. But during that commercial break, I looked up and all of a sudden, like my lap times were kind of holding steady. I forgot what they were like. It must have been high 31s. And I was starting to get a little tired. And I see I crossed the line one lap and I see like a 32 up there or a little higher 32. And I was like, well, that's weird. Like, I didn't feel like I slowed down. So I was like, All right, I got to give it a little bit more gas. And then I saw like another high 32 and another mid 31. And I was like, like that doesn't seem right. Like I really feel like I'm going faster. So it turns out Jonathan, my teammate, he, he was injured. So he, his back was just starting to blow up and he was just starting to kind of slow down a little bit. And I was picking it up and going faster. So he was ahead by like 200 meters, which on a long track oval is like 16, 17 seconds in a race like that. And with like 10, 12 laps to go, I was like, oh, I'm starting to catch Jonathan because all of a sudden I could see him at the end of the straightaway. And then when I started to see him and I kept seeing like multiple of my lap times, I was like, oh shit, like I could like win my Olympic bid if I win this race right now. And so then I was like, okay, like head still down, just doing what I got to do, but like I'm catching him, like he's mine. And so like for the last 10 laps of the race, just like inched closer and closer and closer. And then like I, I had mentioned to you that we switched laps every, uh, every lap on the back stretch. So I actually caught him with one lap to go um, in the, in the second to last corner. And for the first time in 24 and a half laps, I was ahead of him, but then I had the last outer corner. And going into that last outer, I was like, I did not just claw my way back, you know, down 15, 17 seconds to lose it because I'm finishing on the outer and he can now chase me on the inner. And so we entered that corner, corner like almost dead even, but I was just like, not today. And I just came out and we almost like, you know, the, that corners, it's an extra like five meters, the difference between an inner and out, an inner corner and an outer corner. And I was like, not, not going to happen. And I just gassed it around that outer corner and ended up beating him by 0.07 at the line across a 13 minute and 22 second race. How fast are you going? Um, I think it depends on the race, but I think the sprinters can really get up to close to like the high 30 miles an hours, like 36, 38 miles an hour. Whereas I think, Middle distance guys, 10K guys, or it's probably like mid to high 20s, stuff like that. So in the, in that range, I mean, I think the fastest lap, we've seen people do like a 23-second lap across 400 meters. Oh, so my. So you kind of relate that to like the fastest lap you've seen on track, someone running. Obviously, it's way different. But, yeah. you know, that's that's almost twice as fast, which is kind of crazy to think about. So Emery, when you're, what are the things that you have to be aware of? Okay. So when we're watching, right? So again, like I'm sitting comfortable, I ain't cold. I, you know, my life doesn't depend on this race for the next funding for the next, uh, you know, four years yeah. and I'm watching, what am I not understanding of the things that you have to be aware of the details you have to be aware of at that 35 miles an hour while you're on ice and you have these little tiny like blades that are going across. There is honestly so much. I don't even know how to put it all into like the short time that we have. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to watch our 18 pursuit race in particular hours, but I always say like in the best team pursuit races, you 
will not see my face the entire race because I'm skating that far away from Casey or Joey or whoever's leading the race. Um, so we developed this new strategy in this race where instead of having someone peel off every lap and take a, you know, take a lead, pull off, take a lead, pull off. We determined with the help of some aerodynamic specialists that it would be faster to just push the guy in front and just skate. And so for me, like for every inch I can get closer to that guy is less air that I have to take on. So like when I'm pushing, like I'm, you know, inches from the guy in front of me. And I don't know if you can imagine, but at 30 plus miles an hour and you're an inch away from another guy going 30 miles an hour, and there's a guy behind you, a couple inches behind you going 30 miles an hour. Like there's a lot of cohesion. There's a lot of room for error, obviously. Like we're not perfect every time we click skates, we hit each other, we fall. Like so there's, it's just a lot of focus. It's just like things that you've had to like hone in over the last 10, 15, five years of like, what do I need to do to go fast, to follow the leader, to get him across the line the fastest. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot. So let's talk about that drag thing, the, the drag part and, and um, uh, drafting, because this was something that I wasn't aware of, but I, I obviously I'm a high level cyclist. That's how we met. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who didn't hear the story, my dumb butt thought it would be great to ride Guardsman's Pass, and I wanted to do it on my bike. Well, I'm not in that type of shape. It's about a 21 to 2200 uh, um, foot climb over five and a half miles. I'm not in that type of shape, but I told my wife I wanted to do it. So I got up after watching Arnold Schwarzenegger and he had really pumped me up and I thought I could do everything. And I got on the mountain the first day. I didn't tell you this, Emery, but I rode 200 yards. And after 200 yards, I was like, that's good. And then I got back in my truck and I went home. The whole month I was kind of riding little bit by little bit. And then at the end of the month, I went, I went rock climbing with my friend. And it was the first time and I'm horrible at it, but we come home and he's like, dude, we're, we're are you pumped? And I was like, yeah, I'm kind of pumped because, you know, energy, whatever from, from climbing the wall. And I did the kitty wall, yeah. but I come home and he's like, man, let's watch free solo. And I was like, yes. So I was in <laughs> and then I was watching free solo and he was like, I'm going to climb the, uh, the, the wall, but I'm not telling anybody because everyone's going to freak out. And I was like, this guy is in my head. I'm not telling my wife, but I'm waking up tomorrow morning. I'm riding Garzman's Pass. And I ride it, and I am puffing and puffing. I must have stopped 100 million times. And I finally peaked it. I got to the, or summited it, whatever you call it, got to the top, and I thought, ain't nothing could touch me. I didn't realize the dangerous part is going down. So yeah. I start going down. Emery, I'm locked up, like brakes completely locked. But I'm still going 20 miles an hour with brakes locked completely. As I start to get down to a flat part, I start to feel my bike wobble and then a gunshot, pow. And I'm thinking, oh man, you know, this is a, to add to my story. I got shot on the way. You know what I mean? Like I'm thinking, and I realize it's my back tire. So I pop off to the side of the road. Meanwhile, I see four of the most elite athletes just whisk by very uh, calm and easy riding the hill that it took me a hundred times to stop. And you guys ride by. And I remember you saying like, Hey man, you need some help? And I was thinking, man, I just watched Free Solo. I don't need any help. <laughs> and then you did a loop and you were looping what I was doing one time, working my whole life to be able to do. But you came back and then you were like, oh, man, you need some help? And I was like, uh, I, yeah, I guess so. You jumped off, you helped me, you did the whole nine. Um, and so that's how, <laughs> that is how we, we met. Um, and I don't even, uh, so it, when we talk about those kind of things, right. And, and the, uh, the drafting part, I learned about it one time cause I generally only ride by myself. And then I rode in a group one time and I was like, man, they put me in the pack and it, it almost pulled me forward. Yeah. Can you talk about this drafting and how it relates in life to the proximity? Because I look at it when you were talking about it earlier, you were drafting your parents and your brother in your life too. But talk to us about that correlation. How much energy do you conserve by drafting when you're going through? 
Yeah, I mean, it's 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 pretty crazy. I mean, the biggest example I can kind of relate to like what it feels like when you're skating in that team pursuit and when I'm close enough to my teammate and I'm tucked in low, you know, out of the air, it, you know, I, I really feel like, yeah, like all that energy can just be what we're, the strategy is, is meant to just be pushed into that guy ahead of you. Whereas if I were to like, which there are times when I do like peek out to look what the lap time is, see what the coach is saying, try and listen to them. And if you poke your head out too far, it's, it's actually feels like you're in a car driving 30 miles an hour and you stick your head out the window. And like, that's what, that's like the difference of being like behind someone like that. Obviously it's a little bit less cause I'm also pushing, you know, skating myself, but it's, it's, it, it feels like that when the wind, when you get out of that wind tunnel and you stick your head out there and you get all of his draft, that's kind of coming up and over both of you guys. And you put your head right in the middle of that. It feels like sticking your head out of a car going 20, 30 miles an hour. Well, it, talk to us too about the, the proximity part, because, you know, it, when you look at the relationship with your pop, the relationship with your mom, the relationship with your brother, right? Being an elite athlete and being one of the most elite athletes, I mean, literally in the world, in the world, how many uh, will make the team for the, for the Olympic team? How many of you guys, the speed skating? Uh, for long track speed skating, the max we'll have is 16. Okay. So 16 people in the, in, in our country, 16, only 16. Can you imagine if there was only 16 spots in your job, like a structural engineer, when you get out and there's only 16 jobs in the whole entire country, that's what you got. You got one of those. So when you're doing that, how important is the proximity and friendships that you, uh, your circle that is around you? I mean, that's incredibly important, especially, especially in an event like the team pursuit where like I'm following someone so closely and someone behind me is following me so closely. Like there is a lot of trust that needs to go into all of us, you know, like we need to trust the guy in first to skate well, skate consistent so that we're not tripping up behind him. I need, he needs to trust us that, you know, he's breaking all the wind for us. He needs to trust us that we're actually going to be pushing him and we're not just going to be sitting there freeloading and just getting the draft and not doing anything. And then, you know, the guy in back needs to trust that like, we're going to be breaking the wind. We're going to be skating well enough so that he has the ability to have all that extra energy. So like, I always say it's like the, it's easiest when everybody thinks they have the hardest job. And so, or sorry, it's easiest when everyone thinks they have the easiest job. Okay. Cause then that means that, you know, like I'm like, Ooh, thank God I'm not up front breaking the wind and thank God I'm not in back pushing two fat people, you know, two, two, two big guys. <laughs> Whereas the guy in front's like, you know, thank God I'm not in back. Like I got two guys pushing me. And then the guy in back's like, man, I just got to sit here and push like, okay, that's it. So, you know, it's, it's, it's best when everybody thinks their job's the easiest. Cause then everybody, or yeah, the easiest. Cause then they feel like they need to contribute more, do more, help the team out more. And that's kind of like the mindset we take when we do that. So is it uh, the Olympic teams? So like, as far as team USA, is it a, a close knit fraternity kind of like the NBA where, um, you know, if you're an Olympian, are you, do you connect with other Olympians or do you stay inside of your realm when you get to the, to the Olympics itself? Um, when we get to the Olympics itself, yes. Uh, it's, it, we definitely stay together tight knit, but also like the way they have it set up is like dorms. Um, so like there's a team USA dorm, but at the same time, there's also what people don't realize. I'm not sure how summer works, but in the winter Olympics, there's three Olympic villages. There's like the ice sports, there's the endurance sports, and then there's like the mountain sports. So we really don't have any familiarity with, you know, like those other two villages cause they're sometimes over an hour away which stinks because like we're on the same team. We're all rooting for each other. We're all following each other's success. So like stinks to like not be able to like go hang out with, you know, some of the snowboarders, the Nordic skiers or, you know, whoever. Um, but with that being said, those of us that are in the, the ice village, I say like, it's very close. Like there are people that I've met in 2014 that I'm like still really good friends with. And like, there's people like, you don't even know their names and they're like, Oh, like, you did really well. And then you're like, well, you did really well. And it's like, you just kind of like sharing each other's success, gassing each other up, having a good time and like kind of being part of this team. 
I think there's a much bigger push now to like get the Olympians to connect outside of the Olympics, which is where I think like the relationship should start because, you know, once you're at the Olympics, you're there to compete and it's, you're not there to like, I mean, as crappy as it is, you're not there to like go out, meet friends, do all these things. Like that's the time where like, I've been training for four years for this. Obviously I'm going to enjoy it and I'm going to meet people, be nice, but there's not a ton of time to be like, Oh, I met that guy. He, he, I liked him. It was really cool. Like I'm going to go spend all day hanging out with him or whatever, you know, like you're there. Like I got to train. Yeah. I met someone cool at the cafeteria. Like a shame. We don't train in the same place, link up outside. Cause we're both, we've been on the last three Olympic Olympic teams together. So I think there's should be, or is a bigger push now to like try and get like team USA to connect outside of just the Olympics. How do you keep the the humility that you have? Because when we met, when I was, you know, I was I was doing my type of training, which was silly. Um, but the graciousness that you had, you were in the middle of training, in the midst of training. And by, I mean, I, you made me feel bad about myself because you were doing loops on what I was doing one time. Okay. So we'll just put that out there for our friendship. <laughs> But you took time out of your day and the other three Olympians stopped and made sure I was good. You changed my tire and then told me, because you had never seen it happen, right? Because this, this was yeah. like, so would you call that a world record? Oh, well, it's definitely a record in my eyes because I've never seen it. <laughs> okay, so, I, I mean, you know, we... You know, we relate now. We relate. My yeah. tire blew out the, the carbon, for those of you listening... Uh, or even watch it like the carbon on the side of my tire, it completely exploded. And then Emery put it back together and was like, just, just ride slow, man, <laughs> like ride slow. But I had five and a half miles to go down. So a, a, a couple in a minivan uh, picked me up. Thank you to them. Big shout out to them. But your humility, like you were present with me, you got off your bike, you did that. How do you foster that when, to do what you do, one of only 16 in our country and one of the most elite athletes in the world that has to have this killer instinct, how do you go from killer instinct, I'm chasing him down, uh, you know, I'm a uh, half a lap behind and I'm catching you and I'm getting you, to serving and changing someone's tire that you don't even know? I think I get a lot of that. I think, you know, a lot of people on our team are – I mean, not to say that it's only Midwest people, but kind of have that Midwest niceness to us. But like, I think I get a lot of that from my mom. You know, she, my mom and my dad, like going out of the way to help people. Um, and I think that's a common theme in my family. You know, like I have aunts, uncles that are just phenomenal people go out of their way. And I'm just like, it, it's just some of the, some of the acts of kindness that they tell me about, or I hear from my cousins about them doing, or my brother, whoever, like, I'm just like trying to, trying to be, trying to be as much like them as possible. You know, my mom and dad, like they're phenomenal people. They help people out like crazy. They have taken people into our home if, when they've had nowhere to go. My, you know, my parent, my dad gives blood as much as he can. My mom volunteers her time as much as he can. Like they're just like phenomenal people. And I just, uh, I'm always trying to make them proud. And so like, if I see something, see something that I can help with, then I just figure like, I, I got to do it because that's, you know, that's, that's the way I was raised. And that's the the person I'm trying to be. I mean, it was a pinch me moment when, when we met, because like, here I am on the side of the road, I'm thinking, man, my wife is right. I'm going to get hurt or whatever it was. <laughs> and she, and I was like, I'm not telling my wife that this happened. <laughs> but, but then you show up and I'm like, dude, this is the greatest experience. Like I just, my tire exploded. And now I get to tell the story because now I have a new friend and not only a new friend, but I have an Olympic medalist that is now my friend. So I don't even have to get an Olympic medal anymore. Like, because we, we have one together, Emery, because we're exactly. friends, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's us together. And, but it was a pinch me moment. It was huge for me. I've, I've never got a chance to be able to, you know, be able to, uh, connect with a, with an Olympian. And so it was, it blew my mind. I was, I've been bragging about you since. Um, talk to us about some of your pinch me moments because you're creating them in everyone else's lives. When people meet Emery, they're like, Oh my gosh, I met Emery. 
when does Emery say, oh my gosh, I got to do X? What was the last or a couple of them pinch me moments for you? Oh man. Um, you know, it's tough. Um, I got, I actually went to a USOPC event and I got to meet LL Cool J. So that was definitely a pinch me moment. But I mean, I'm, I don't know. I think a lot of people might agree or maybe it's just me and how I am, but like, I would consider myself obviously, and I think a lot of people would too, like just a normal guy. Like I'm a normal guy getting a high school or not high school, a master's degree. I'm in school. Um, you know, there's really nothing super, super special about me besides like doing kind of a fun thing, you know? And so I, uh, I get starstruck just as much as everybody, you know, like I'll meet a famous speed skater or like someone like that has a ton of medals and I'll get starstruck. Cause I'm like, Whoa, like they're big time. Um, and I got to, you know, at the Olympics in 2014, I was like, as much as I was there to compete, once my race was over, I was running around. That was the last time we had NHL players at the Olympics. Uh -huh. I was running around getting my picture with every NHL player I could. Like all the Blackhawks were there. Zidane Char was there. Crosby was there. Like that. And then like there's some short track skater. There's a short track skater who had switched from Korea to Russia. And he's just like an absolute legend in the sport of short track. And so like I was just going around, you know, I'm, I'm, I was just a kid at the time. I still kind of consider myself a kid. And so like, I was just kind of going around like starstruck at like, holy cow, like I've seen you on TV. I've seen you on TV. I saw you win the Stanley cup last year, like all these cool things. And that, that was, so I'm, I, I get fascinated probably way easier starstruck pinch me moment way easier than the average person. I think. Who's the, who's the one Olympian that you would like to meet that maybe you haven't? Ooh, man, it's tough. Cause there's a lot of speed skaters that obviously I hold in very, very high regard. Um, if I had to choose someone outside of speed skating, I think I would choose like Mark Spitz or someone, someone just like an absolute legend in the sport and someone who had like a really, really big Olympic legacy. Cause I, not to brag, but I've met a lot of speed skaters that I've like really, really looked up to throughout the years. And that for me, like that they've all have been like, and pinch me moments. And then like, at the same time, like getting to train with some of these people is just like crazy. Well, anyone out there listening or watching, October 5th is going to be the Vibe Room. It's there in Salt Lake City, and you'll have the opportunity to meet Emery. I told Emery he's got to come and uh, hang with us there at the Vibe Room. It would, I mean, and to, to experience your humility, that's the, that's the part that freaked me out the most because a lot of times, again, when someone's elite at what they do, the connection point, your connection point, I want to compliment you on this, the, the connection point that you have, Emery, is is unbelievable, man. Like to see it and the, the, the way that you stay present, right? I want to talk about this too, because like, how, how tall are you? Uh, six foot. Okay. At six foot, what, it, what weight do you maintain? Like 185, 188. Okay. So a lot of guys that do what you do or want to, maybe they don't do it at the level, there's a lot of guys out there that are six foot. There's a lot of guys out there that are 185. There's a lot of guys out there that maybe train to a certain area. Maybe they could run as fast as you, ride the bike, whatever it is. What is that little difference? Because it's not the physical part that helps you to be one of the 16 that make it to one of the others that don't. What's that difference? Oh, man. I think that's a combination of the genes my mom and dad passed along to me, but they just have, especially if you met my mom, not to discredit any, not to discredit my dad at all, <laughs> but my mom, like, man, she is relentless. Like she, she will not take no for an answer. She can talk to anybody for however long. And I think just a lot of that has just rubbed into this work ethic of like, okay, you have a goal in mind, like, keep working towards it. And even if it, you don't want to, and as I'm sure everybody heard, everybody is 
heard or everybody has seen like it's like you get up you don't want to train well it's like the people that do that and train is how they get to where they're going and the people that say like yeah i don't really want to today that kind of don't really follow that path and make it to where they think they can go so i think that a combination of that a combination of just kind of wanting to be different wanting to stand out and then now in my later years of my career just want to fulfill the most of what time little time i have left in the sport is just really kind of keeps me going talk to us about the gravity part because most of us have like you know you were talking about 2014 so then you know when, when the olympics in 2014 but they only come once every four years so we were just watching the the uh, documentary my wife is a huge sean white fan and we were watching his documentary and it was like, you know, I, he, he competed in five, five Olympics or four. I think 06, 2010, 14, 18, 22. Yeah. Five, I think. So he did five and it's like, wow. I mean, I, I know he competed in a lot of other stuff, but as far as Olympics, it was five in a 20 year career. Can you talk about the gravity of that? Because I mean, if I only got to do my job once every four years now, and I trained and then I got to do one thing once every four years, most people can't even fathom that. But can yeah. you take us, can you take us into that mindset? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of buildup. I mean, luckily we have a lot of world cups, world championships, other competitions that kind of mentally prep you for that one Olympic race. But I, can't lie and say that it like it doesn't like get a little bit more and more pressure or more stress in the back of your mind as the olympics comes closer i mean we essentially in speed skating are kind of like living our lives in like four-year intervals so it's just like post olympic year post post olympic year pre-olympic year olympic year there's just like those four years and so like this season is post post olympic year but then and so you really think that like, oh, it's four years, like that's a long time. But in sport, that is like nothing because you really want to be, obviously you want to be your best Olympic year, but you still got to be good pre-Olympic year. And so that really gives you, and then, you know, the year after the Olympics is kind of, you know, you're obviously still, still training, but, you know, the stress of the Olympics being four years away kind of makes it you know, a little bit of an off year in that sense, even though everything else is the exact same. So like in reality, like, I don't know, it just, it always, every time the Olympics passes, like uh, uh, there's like a, a documentary thing on HBO about this, where like you kind of get this like post Olympic depression of like shit, like four more years. But man, like when you're training 11 and a half months out of the year, like time flies. Like, I feel like, the Olympics was, I always tell people like about stories about the Olympics or things I did after. And I'm like, yeah, like this past like May. And it's like, no, like that was already a year ago. And like last season already passed. And once this season's done, like we're in the thick of it. We're in pre-Olympic year already. So Emery, talk to us about like, take us into a day of training, like as an Olympian. Um, Cause yeah. this, this freaked me out when you were telling me a couple of things about it. And I was like, man, that doesn't sound anything like me watching uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger four episodes in a row and then getting up, listening to some gangster rap and riding for 200 yards. Um, yeah. It didn't sound like it at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but take us through that day step by step, because I want people to understand, like, I mean, you're one of 16, like one of 16. It's unbelievable to me. Yeah. Um, typical day, uh, depending on what time the morning session uh, starts, like in the fall, it's usually ice. And in the summers, it's usually a bike ride. But I always try and get up a reasonable time before that so that I can eat a good breakfast. I find if I eat too close, like if I have to be at the rink at 8, it means I have to leave at 7.30. If I'm waking up at 7.15, like, I'm not going to get a good breakfast in. I'm not going to digest it. So I always try and be up, you know, at least 45 minutes before I have to leave for whatever training. So I'm like walking around for at least 15, 20 minutes. Then I'm like, yeah, I'm really hungry. So I'm getting up 45 minutes before I got to head out of the house. Then what do you eat? eat? Yeah, Emery, what do you eat? Like, what is like to stay at your, like, uh, uh, godlike 
figure. Um, what do you eat, man? I mean, with the amount of calories we're burning, it's pretty much eat anything. Like I ate a full dinner, steak, Brussels sprouts, pasta last night. And then I had to run out for an errand and Domino's pizza was calling my name and I just <laughs> housed a whole pizza. So um, it's really just like trying to keep up because like, you know, whatever, if you think about it, like whatever food you eat is the energy you have for the next workout, then it kind of like puts into perspective that like, I just got to eat and eat and eat. And obviously like eating cleaner is yeah. better energy and it breaks down better. But at the end of the day, you just, you got to eat and you got to keep up with the amount of calories you're burning. How many are you burning on a, on a, on a training day? And then get back to the training. I'm, I know I keep interrupting you, but yeah. this stuff is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. It depends on the day. I think, um, more than, I don't know how we use polar. I don't know how accurate that is. Like on a normal day, like average training day, I think it's anywhere from like three to 5,000, maybe three to 6,000. I've seen my watch again. I don't know how accurate this is, but I've seen it say like 8,000 on a, like the heaviest day I've seen. And like, I don't know how you eat 8,000 calories in a day. <laughs> hey, if you come over with me, I got a training program that will show you how to be able to eat 8,000. We'll do it. We'll do it before lunch. Um, okay. So, uh, you, you wake up, you get ready, uh, 45 minutes before you have a nice big breakfast. Um, you yeah. know, you go, you're, you're at, uh, on the ice at eight. Yeah. So like if we're getting on the ice at, usually it's around nine. So if we're on the ice at nine means I got to be at the rink at eight. So you usually have an hour warm up. Usually, um, if you have an injury, kind of go in there, get heated up, get a little bit of treatment, run a mile, do some stretching, do some, uh, skating specific things to warm up your muscles. Takes about 15 minutes to get to the locker room, get changed, walk over, get your skates on. Then we're usually on the ice from like nine to 11, get our workout in maybe 1130 get off the ice, do a little bit of off ice training, get home, eat what lunch. Kind of, what kind of off ice training? And how fast did you run this mile? Cause I'm tired even from you just talking about it. So how fast do you run the mile? We do not run it fast. Um, I mean, it's gotta be like 10 minute mile pace. It's really just to like wake the body up and just get, get going. I feel, I feel like you're judging me now. You just said it's not fast. It's a 10 minute mile. And I'm like, when I break 10 minutes, I'm like, I'm showing my wife. I'm like, look, I'm ready. I'm ready for that next mountain. Okay. So yeah. you, you run a, a Emory slow mile, which is 10 minutes. Then you, then you, what's the, what's the, the training once you get off the ice that you said, cause you were kind of moving through that quick. Yeah. So usually that's like something we call it dry land. I don't know how common of a term that is to everybody else but speed skaters but essentially it's like skating specific movements that you would do on the ice off the ice so norwegian split squats we call it dry skating which is like you're in skating position you're mimicking skating in place isometrics in skating position we do this thing called like turn belt which is like essentially like a seat belt material that's in a big loop and someone puts it around their waist and the person who's doing the exercise puts it around like the middle of their body. And you just kind of like do your crossovers simulating like you're skating off the ice and it kind of helps you simulate that lean a little bit. So st stuff like that, just stuff to make your legs tired and get used to that, that pain. Okay. So once we're done with that, do you go to lunch after this? Yep. So after that, get, get a recovery shake in, get lunch in as quick as possible, nap, pretty much I try and do it almost every day. <laughs> That's something I'm not going to be used to when I have a regular job and I'm not able to nap every day. <laughs> um, but yeah, nap, wake up, probably eat another snack, then hit the afternoon training, whether it's bike or weights or sprinting, whatever it is, uh, do that. Then after that, recovery shake again, recovery things, stretching, yoga, rolling out, ice bath, all those things. And then uh, cook dinner, do some homework, go to bed. Good Lord, man. 
Now let's yeah. talk. Let's talk about the personal life. And I, 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 I talked to the, or I asked you the question earlier before we started recording. But how is it translating into the personal life? Because what what I've seen, you you've read. Uh, have you read Tim Grover? No, I haven't. Okay, not. so he has a book called Relentless. You don't need to read it because you already are relentless and you don't need to read the book. But in it, he talked about the the light side and then the dark side of apex predator type of people. When I say a predator, not in a bad way, but a, a yeah. person who has that killer instinct. And he talked about the, the light side and the dark side, and you have to accept the dark side with the light side. And sometimes people are so good at their sport, but then in other areas of their life, it suffers. Mm-hmm. How are you able to translate like having the killer instinct going after this thing and then talk to us about the personal life? I mean, do you hold, I mean, in our friendship, it's okay for you to hold me to that type of standard because you obviously know the type of elite athlete that I am in, you know, because I, I have a world record with the tire and all those things. <laughs> but with your other friends, do you hold, like, do you hold them to the type of standards that you have for yourself? Um, you know, once I'm out of the rink, I really try and, um, you know, obviously I, I have friends who I played sports with and that's mainly how I grew up getting to know these guys. Um, but when I'm outside of the rink, I try and disassociate from training and sport. I mean, I, I like to do pickup sports definitely and have fun. Um, but I try and just, give myself a break outside of all that just because I it's I try and save all that for training and I you know I have really good relationships with all them but yeah when, when I'm outside of skating I try and just get as far removed from skating as possible just to like give yourself that break so that um like there was a, a skater at the last Olympics who kind of came out with a, a, a book a training log thing and he was just like he would take enough time off so that you, it makes you miss it. It makes you mm. want to go back. Like while you're there, not doing training things that you're like, man, like I can't wait to get back on the bike and just, just go get after it. And so like, I kind of take the same thing as like, if I had that mindset of just like, I'm getting after it in training and then I go with my friends and we got to get after it and whatever we're doing. Then I just feel like that would mentally, you know, like when I was a kid, I feel like I could do that. But now as I get older, it's like I got to, you know, I got to pick and choose. And I think also like taking a step away from that and like making yourself be like, you know, you're hanging out with friends doing whatever. And you're like, man, like I really cannot wait for that next workout. Like I can't wait to get back on the ice and just rip it. And I think that is much more healthy because then it makes you look forward to the next training. It makes you miss it, I guess, in a way, if that makes sense. Emery, how, how important is it to – prepare. And the thing that was mind blowing to me that you said earlier before, I think it was before we started recording is you said most of the things that get you prepared for the ice don't have anything to do with the ice. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that preparation, like the preparation and the importance of it? Yeah. So it, you know, it's such a weird sport. Um, you know, like it's, it's like, I mean, you think about it, you're out there. It's an insanely technical sport. It's an insanely physically demanding sport. And it's an insanely mentally challenging sport because it's not like many other sports where you're racing. You are racing head to head, but you could beat your pair by, you could lap your pair in a long track speed skating race in whatever event. And you guys could be second to last in last place. And your pair could lap you in a race and that could be first place and you could be second place. So it's a weird sport where it's like, it's all time trial based. And I know there's a few other sports out there like that, but it's truly just like a time trial sport where it's like, you're out there and it's very, you're very, very much alone. And so there's a lot of things that you need to do mentally and physically to like prepare for, for that. Um, whether it's, visualization off the ice, whether it's the off ice technical work, whether it's the, you know, getting, getting the hours on the bike so that you're in a good enough shape to like hit that intensity on the ice, whatever it is, like, there's just so many things you need to do to be well balanced in once you get on the ice and it's just you, your pair, 
who you have no idea what's going to happen with them, but essentially it's just you and the clock out there. And that's just such a tough thing to prepare for. I mean, if you were to break it down, right? So maybe five, six, seven points, whatever it is. And you, you had to deliver this to the kid who was a aspiring Olympian. Mm -hmm. What would those points be? when you were defining a Olympic state of mind? Ooh, man, I think, I think I could put it in like only a couple here. I mean, okay. like, so how many, how many you think, how many you think you trying to, see. I might have to, I might have to stop as I go along, but I have okay. two like right off the bat and like two that have really resonated with me was like, like whatever you do, you just got to keep going. You know, like when I was sick with mono, skating like crap, it was like, you still got to show up. You still got to work out. You still got to just, you got to be there. And whether you hate it, whether things are going horribly, whether things are going perfectly, like you got to be there and show up consistently. And then the other thing, so I guess two points, I guess. Uh, the second point was just, would just be like, just getting a little bit better and better each day. You know, it's such a monotonous sport. You turn in, you know, we're only turning left. We don't even, you know, sometimes we, we do uh, practice turning right off the ice just to like balance out our hips. But like, we're only turning left. We're going straight, we turn left. We go straight, we turn left. It's very, very repetitive. And so like, it's tough because like you're trying to shave off tens, hundredths across, you know, a 400 meter race. And um, just like working on getting just that 1% better, a little bit better changing one little thing um every time you go out there is is something that i've kind of got away from for a while but something i've kind of come back to and it's been just like such a tremendous thing to think about is like what am i doing today to be better than i did last time i did this and uh i think that that's those are like the two main points is like you just got to keep going and going can't give up just got to put in the work day and day in and day out and then just a little bit, tiny bit, even if it's half a percent, a quarter of a percent better every day. So talk to those little kids out there that look at you. I mean, well, I'm one of them that, you know, it was, I was starstruck when I, when I met you. Now you're just my, you know, you're my buddy. Like we're, we're best friends now. Um, but talk to those kids that look at you and be like, oh my God, this is an Olympic medalist. This is, I mean, this is the top of the top. I mean, this is one of the most elite in the game. What is the biggest mistake that you've made in your career? Um, biggest mistake. I think two of them. Uh, one would be like think like taking things for granted. Like, you know, you I got really between the ages of like fourteen and seventeen, I got really good really quick, and I was like this is easy. Like all I got to do is show up, listen to my coach and I'm going to get better. And then for a while there, I kind of took that for granted. Like, no, like I was for that age, like my mom and dad kind of had me on the right track of eating the right things, doing the right things, you know, showing up, putting in the work and you kind of get away from that and take for granted. Like, well, I've been getting better the last four years in a row. Then you kind of get complacent and forget about all those little things that were making you better. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's the biggest one. And then another one I would say is like thinking that success is going to come overnight, you know, especially in the sport of speed skating, like, because we do things all the time, like the same thing, the same, you know, it's a right straightaway stroke, a left straightaway stroke, a left corner stroke and a right corner stroke. There's four kind of strokes you do across a 400 meter track for all the hours that we do. And I think you think like, okay, like I'm going to make this change and it's not just going to happen like overnight or one day. So I think like the one thing is like, yeah, like taking things for granted and like showing up and acknowledging that, yeah, I want to change this in my technique and it's not going to happen in one day or one week. It could take a month, a couple months, a couple years for it to really settle in. And that's, that's a pretty tough tough thing to admit, but it's, it's kind of the way it goes in the sport. I'm assuming that this didn't happen to you, but 
Um, there have been times in my life where talent um, stepped in and, and, and gave me a false confidence. And I met up with a person with less talent that had hard work and scrap, and I got whooped. Did this ever happen to you? And how important is it to add, like, because I was talking to my son about this. My son is insanely talented. Like, he's ridiculously talented at what he does. But I was telling him, I said, that's only going to take you so far, son. When you get to a point where you'll add hard work to it, there'll be a kid with half your talent that will whoop you. Whoop yeah. you because they want it more. Has, has that ever happened? And how important is that scrap? You know, I, I think we've been on the other side of it. Like we've been the ones to like, like in the team pursuit, for example, like if you compared our times to like that of all these other teams that were competing at the Olympics, like individually, like we were not Olympic champions. We were not, we're, we had the world record in the team pursuit, but like we had not, we had nothing really else to really put ourselves on the same pedestal as like all these other skaters on all these other teams individually. And I think that us being on the other side of that, of like, we're going to just try and perfect this team pursuit, work together, be cohesive. I think that's what got us our medal. Um, you know, we weren't individually, you know, except with the exclusion of Joey Mantia, who's a phenomenal skater, you know, Ethan Casey and I at the time were like really nothing, nothing crazy individually relative to like some of these other skaters who had, multiple world records or multiple world championship medals or Olympic medals. Like we were going up against some guys that were just phenomenal athletes and not to like discredit them, but you know, I think we really just put a lot, a lot of priority on this team pursuit and it's kind of been an event that people take for granted because they're like, we just need three good guys, just throw them in the event and they'll win, you know? And we kind of had three good, three, mid pack guys, I would say. And we were like, nah, like we're going to, we're going to be the best at, we're going to try and like, this is our chance at a medal. And I think that that, you know, that's what got us our medal. And, uh, that was, it was a really cool feeling. Take us to the time when you win the medal. Like, what are you feeling? And cause you'll hear people say like, I, I worked my whole life and then I finally got this thing and it wasn't what I thought it was. And I'm like, I, for me, I, when I've had something like that, and I'm not, I've never had a medal, obviously, but, you know, when I've wanted to do something, I, I'm pretty darn excited about that thing, right? Yeah. Take us into the emotion part and set the stage for us when when you get the medal and then, you know, when you get the medal you and you get to stand on the stage, too, in front yeah. of the world. This is nuts. It's amazing. Yeah. I think... Um with the whole medal, I, the things I remember most are all the trainings that were hard as shit that we had to do going into that. So like, those are, I mean, we've had to do those. I mean, you think about it, like we only skated the team pursuit. There's three rounds at the Olympics. We skated three races total of less than 13 minutes of racing. Oh my God. So like, it's not a lot to remember in the race, but what I do remember is the hundreds of hours that we put in just dying on the track here in Salt Lake and all the time that I spent with my head in a garbage bin throwing up, even like at the Olympics in between on the last day we meddled, like there's an hour and a half in between the semifinal and the final. And I was throwing up for like half of that. And they're like, all right, like time to get out of there. Like you need to get some food and some drink. Cause like you got to race in like an hour and you're, you sound like shit in there. And so like those things I remember most, I like those races, like I kind of remember them, but you know, it, it like almost black out from the, like how hard those things are. But I do remember like the medal ceremony, getting on the podium, being there with my teammates. Like I keep a picture of that with, with those guys on my fridge, you know, obviously having an individual medal would be the coolest thing in the world, but also like getting to share those memories and that medal and those experiences is, you know, I'm, I hockey lacrosse. I've always been a huge team sport 
guy. I love the camaraderie. I love the, the struggle that you have to go through together to kind of get there. And so like being able to share the medal with those three guys, but also like the Olymp the Olympic speed skating team, my national team, like I had a trainer who was at the Olympics with us, who I'd been working with since I was like 17 years old. And she's been, you know, she had never gotten to work at an Olympics and she got to go there, like getting to share that moment with her, with my coach, teammates, like all these people, like it was, it was incredibly special. So I would like to think that you are completely ridiculously focused every time you're racing. Um, my mind goes different places sometimes. Like when I'm, you know, in a place I'm like squirrel or like I like hot dogs or, you know what I'm saying? Take us to one of the funniest thoughts you have during, or do you go, or do you just stay locked in? Or sometimes uh, does your mind go to another place, or like a quick thought or anything like that? I think in the shorter races, no, but back when I like that Olympic trials, 10 K and when I had to skate 10 Ks, I remember like going to the line and skating these laps. Like I can't believe my mom and my coach are making me skate this 10 K, <laughs> you know, like that, like I can't believe I'm skating another 10 K. And then like that changed within that race to like, Oh, I'm winning this thing, you know? So. Did you ever I, think about anything outside of skating, like during a tent? Because that's a long race. It's a long race. You, Did you, you know, ever think about like In and Out or like a, a pizza <laughs> or? I don't think so because, you know, it's such a technical sport. Okay. That, like every time, you know, I wish I had a funny story like that. I think the only thought I've had outside of like a skating thought is like, man, I got to take a shit right now. <laughs> <laughs> But like, any, other than that, I don't know if I had anything else. <laughs> what is your funniest Olympic story that you have? Oh, my funniest Olympic story. I'm trying to think. I remember. I don't know if this is my funniest, but I remember like. When I was 17, I was like, I still am kind of like a goofball. But anytime I would be meeting any of these hockey players, I'd get like really shy, kind of clam up like, and they were all like super nice. Like anytime you talk to them, they would ask you how you're doing, what your sport is, like all that stuff. But I remember like we were in the room, I was seven at Sochi, 17, like just being like a total fuck, like total goofball and just being totally ridiculous. And like one of my teammates was like being equally as ridiculous, probably not as nearly as ridiculous as me, but ridiculous. And he walks out in the hallway, closes the door behind him. And he goes, and I just hear him like, Emery, come out here. And I was just like, probably too busy being a doofus and a goofball that I was just like messing around. And I remember running out and I was just wearing like, I think just like underwear, or just shorts, like nothing else. Like, being a total weirdo and he's like, Emery, come out here. And I run out there and all of a sudden like it's, he's like, Hey, can you take this picture with me and like Patrick Kane? And I was just like, Oh no. Like, like one of the, my, like, I think John, I think at the time Duncan Keith and Jonathan Taze were kind of two of my favorite, but like, I mean, you're talking like first round draft pick face of the franchise, one of the faces of the franchise. And I'm just out there like in my underwear like hat on backwards, probably looking like an idiot. Like, can I get a picture with you too? <laughs> <laughs> so t and, tell me uh, about how that is at 17 years old to be in that realm. Because most, I mean, 17 years old, a lot of times, you know, people don't know how to even deal around their friends, let alone on a world stage. Yeah. I mean, that was luckily I had some really good team, like the teammate that I'd skated against Jonathan cook. He was my roommate that year. And, Brian Hansen, the guy from that story, they both like, they were both closest in age to me. Um, they were really good role models. And obviously like everyone on the team was, but they were kind of the closest in age to me. So they were kind of stuck with me. And they're also both, uh, both from Illinois too. So like uh, close in that sense. But yeah, we, they, they, it was, it's weird. Just kind of like following their lead, trying to replicate how, 
kind and how what great mentors they were to me is kind of like now that I'm one of the older gentlemen on the team, I kind of like try and replicate like what they the leadership and kindness that they showed me. Um, and yeah, hopefully, hopefully doing doing the same and have the same uh, effect on other people in the sport. So when you were, you were talking about Sochi, when you were in Sochi, when you're done with your event, do you go home after that or do you stick around and then watch other events? Yeah. So it depends on the game. So Sochi, I had junior world championships a week after. So I went straight from Russia to Norway, but after Korea, I had to go back to get to school. So I went straight from the Olympics, straight back home. But after both of them, you had time. Like I got to watch a lot of hockey games, figure skating events, short track events, things like that. But after China, we had two competitions. We had another world championships and we had world cup final. So, and also there was the COVID restrictions. So we were very restricted to not really do much in China, Korea, you can you could kind of see it korea was nice because we also in korea and sochi got bikes so you can kind of take your bike outside the olympic village and just kind of walk around got to go to the beach but in sochi you could only really bike around the olympic park and the olympic village just because of the security threats so sochi and beijing were definitely not normal olympics but korea was probably the most normal and that was really cool just like you could like take your bike from the village to a venue, lock it up, do whatever. So that was, that was a really cool experience. What about the Olympic hangover? Because when you go, when you, when you fly at the level that you do, um, and then, you know, you were talking about, you know, going from yeah. one Olympic and you had to go back to school. Um, how is that? Because most of the time people, I, I think normal people like myself, we don't realize the thing that you have to go through emotionally from like, Hey, I'm on top of the world. The whole world is looking at me. Hey, I need to do my homework. I'm, you know, I, I'm in that place. It, or is there a hangover in it? There definitely is. I mean, it, it's, I, I don't mind it just because, you know, I, I value like hanging out with my friends and family a lot. So like I, as much as I love competing and I love the Olympics, I also love like spending time with people that I don't get to spend time with because of the sacrifices from the sport. So like for me, it's almost exciting. It's like, okay, like the Olympics was awesome, but like we got a Lehman family reunion in like this month, like I cannot wait to do that. Or like my friends are coming out or I'm going out to visit them in Chicago. Like I cannot wait to see those guys. So as exciting as it is and as tough it is, is to go from like the Olympics to like, four years out or whatever the season's over to like starting a new season from scratch again. I like really look forward to like seeing the people that I get to see on the off seasons. And that's, that's pretty special for me. So Emery on a date, can you take a date uh, uh, ice skating or are you going to be like Billy Madison uh, when he was playing dodgeball? <laughs> so that's actually the reason my mom made my brother and I take skating lessons to be like when we were like in first grade was she wa she didn't want us to be the guys at the rink that took a girl on a date skating and we were just embarrassing ourselves like tripping over our own laces so that is the whole reason I've I think I've only ever gone on one skating date um at the Maggie Daily Ribbon in downtown Chicago but other than that, I have not been able to hone my skills in uh, into a date. But maybe in the future. <laughs> well, on that date though, I mean, did you go? Did you did you get? You know, did you did you come spandexed up, or you know, were you? I did not. But there was a lot of people <laughs> zooming around me, and I almost had to, you know, put them in their place. Show them how they <laughs> show them how a real man does it. That's what I'm talking about, man. You're you're incredible, man. I started the podcast because my kids. Maddox and McKenna, who you'll meet at some point. Um, Maddox is 11 years old, incredible human being. I, I told him this morning, we we're driving to school and I said, son, it's so amazing. And I said, I brag about you all the time because your favorite place is anywhere where you are. And he just looked at me and just smiled and he just gave me a little pound. And my, and then my daughter, she's 14 years old. She's got one of the most incredible personalities, got the biggest heart. She got this sarcastic wit about her. She's an actress and incredible human being. 
So I created the podcast because of them. And I didn't want them to worship idols in their life. I wanted them to be inspired by icons like yourself. So what advice would you have for Maddox and McKenna? And if you could use both their names, it would be awesome. Ooh. The biggest thing, the reason why I got into sp- skating and my advice to Maddox and McKenna would be to just go out every day and try and be special. I, I just wanted to be independent. I wanted to go out and do something different. I wanted to kind of make make my own way in the world. I didn't want to just go to school and do nothing. And, you know, I wanted to go out there and I wanted to do something special and make the most of my time, you know, travel the world, meet new people, make new friends. Um, and it's taken me on an incredible journey. And that's kind of like what really kept me going in skating was like, I, I just don't want to, I don't want to be normal. <laughs> and that's what I would tell Maddox and McKenna. Emery, you're anything but normal, man. I mean, your your humility, your the the humor, being able to like you light up a room, man. Uh, you you lit up the mountain when I was with you, uh, and, and we got a chance to meet. Um, it has been my absolute pleasure and honor, man. And I I, I appreciate you. We as a country appreciate you. Um, I think I appreciate you more. That's why you should have more value on our friendship than all the rest of these people. But, um, I just, I think it's incredible, man. I mean, not only to accomplish what you do to have the type of discipline, but to have the type of humility and integrity that you do, um, and the, the ability to connect with people and, and make other people like I felt, even though I had a busted up bicycle at the time, you still made me feel like I was the star, man. And it was, it, you, it's an incredible art form that you have. And I want to thank you for that, man. Yeah, of course, man. Anytime. And uh, I'm glad, I'm glad our paths crossed. Well, if, if you love uh, Emery, which all of you do, um, there's going to be an opportunity to see him at the Vibe Room uh, October 5th in Salt Lake City at the Edison House. It's the uh, people always were asking me as we started the podcast, they were like, I would love to meet these people. And so what we did is we created the podcast live, which is called the Vibe Room. And we do it in Carlsbad. We're doing it in LA. We're doing one in Salt Lake City, October 5th. Um, it's an incredible, incredible uh, venue. We've got uh, the founder of the E Entertainment Network, Larry Namer. We've got Thorough Bailey, one of the uh, Utah jazz legends. And we We've got an award-winning singer-songwriter named Damian Horn who toured with the Music Mafia, uh, Big and Rich, um, Kid Rock, all those, and he is unbelievable. And now you get a chance to meet an Olympian because my buddy Emery is going to be hanging with us too. So um, I just uh, I want to thank all of you out there that are listening and watching that have helped us get into the top 1% globally of all the podcasts, and it hasn't been because of advertisements. It's been because you guys are just – listening to it, watching it, and sharing it. And we appreciate you. Emery, you're, I mean, I I just got to give you this, man. Um, You are an incredible human being. I can't wait to see, uh, I want to see it in person, um, you know, uh, and and to be able to see you not only, not only compete, man, but just to be able to see you do what you are purposed to do, man. It is so inspiring to all of us. Thank you so much, Kelly. I really appreciate that. And we'll have to get you out to the Oval sometime when you're out here. <laughs> you can you can bet on that, man. And you, uh, Emery, you're officially off the hot seat.